Good morning to the NCT Data Science Seminar. It's my great pleasure to welcome Annika Reinke from DKFZ. Welcome also to Lena meyer hein and thank you for taking over the introduction. All right, uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, today is a bit of an unusual data science seminar uh, because firstly, uh, by popular demand, we have an internal speaker, Annika. And secondly, the talk is not about novel algorithms, but on the topic of validation. Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, what probably unites uh, most of us here in the audience is that our mission is to bring novel methods eventually at some point to patients. And in, in order to do this, we need proper validation strategies, metrics in particular. And these metrics uh, should actually measure, me measure what matters clinically. And from our point of view, this is an underestimated uh, challenge. And you will hear about a lot about this today, actually. Um, Annika studied at the University of Lübeck. She joined uh, DKFZ as a staff scientist without the, a PhD, actually, initially. But after a while, she had so many first and second author publications in the best conferences and journals that we decided that she should actually convert her uh, work into a PhD thesis, which she's doing uh, at the moment. And by now, she's so famous in the medical image analysis community that even as a PhD student, she gets a lot of invitations for talks, uh, even keynotes. She has major roles in various societies and committees. It's very, very impressive. And personally, I can say it's awesome to work with her uh, if you get the chance. <laughs> uh, she's very rigorous and organized, always a step ahead, and at the same time, a very creative team player. So yeah, make yourself your own picture. Uh, the stage is yours, Annika. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I'm very happy to speak here and I will share my screen. All right, yeah, so we will talk about validation, specifically about pitfalls and validation and how we could actually make sure that we're not doing those pitfalls. So uh, let's start. So I'm pretty sure that you're all aware of the success stories of deep learning and AI and healthcare. So we have many papers out there claiming that uh, yeah, their algorithm is the best and novel methodology for a specific problem. But it's actually not so easy to find out which one is really working best because all of uh, the papers are evaluated on their own specific data sets um, under the and not under the same conditions. So it's not really fair to compare them. And also when we talk about machine learning, we often see ourselves somewhere over here exploring the world of machine learning. And the most things that uh, many researchers care about is finding a cool new architecture which can handle many medical problems. However, machine learning is much more than just finding a good model or network architecture. It's also about data set design, high quality annotations, which metrics do we use, how do we rank algorithms, how do we report the results. And all of those topics, as Jenna already said, are somehow a bit underrated, and I would like to show you that we should also take care of those. So when we want to assess a new medication or a new treatment, um, then we do this via clinical trials. And if you have worked with clinical trials already, you know that we have very strict quality control measures for that. We also have an equivalent for AI algorithms, which are biomedical competitions or also so-called um, challenges. Those challenges are often organized at well-known conferences such as Mikai, ISB, but also at platforms like Kaggle. Perhaps you have heard about some Kaggle competitions. And the reasoning behind those challenges is that people are competing against each other under the exact same conditions. So they're using the same data sets, have the same submission policies and all those things. And the winner of those uh, challenges somehow gets famous because well, there's often high price money, money which is nice, uh, but it's also the new state of the art method. So it gets highly cited, somehow gets famous, and in some cases also the algorithm is translated into clinics. So those challenges have been a great step forward for validation. Besides the fair comparison, often we also have new benchmark data sets and challenges, which is of course nice in the healthcare area where we often suffer that we don't have enough data for our uh, algorithms. You will find a challenge for basically all problems that you can imagine because we have various fields of application covered, various modalities. So if you want to see how good your algorithms perform and you will in most of the cases find a challenge that fits your purposes. 
And just as a side note, if you read a paper at the moment, you often see such tables as in those examples here, where algorithms are comparing their methods to other methods, to baseline methods, state-of-the-art methods. And this makes them somehow a mini challenge. So if you want to publish your method, comparing it against others, you should also be aware about pitfalls and problems that I'm talking about. So uh, it's not only about competitions, but it's also for personal algorithm validation and benchmarking. So given the importance of those challenges, uh, we have asked ourselves the best uh, the question, is the winner really the best? And do we have enough quality control for challenges? Which would be very important also if we think about the equivalent of clinical trials, which do have a very high quality standard. One of the things that we first looked about is the reporting. Because as you see in this quotation here, the one practice that can universally commend it as transparent and complete report, uh, reporting of all facets of the study. And this is also true for challenges because we want to make sure that the results are reproducible and interpretable. So we went ahead and had a look at uh, challenge parameters that matter. There are some that may be like obvious, like which metrics did we use for performance measurement? How many uh, data sets, uh, some training and test cases do we have available? But there are also some that may not be so obvious. So things like, are we allowed uh, as a participant to complement the training data with publicly available data or own data? How do we handle missing values from submissions? Who annotated the data? How many observers? So all of those things matter for a challenge and also for your mini challenge for algorithm validation. So we had a look at more than 500 different competitions and checked how many of those parameters were reported. And unfortunately, only two thirds of those parameters were reported across those challenges. And only 6% of them were reported by all challenges. And that's, those were parameters like challenge name or website. So something that is quite obvious. To give you some examples of what uh, this means. So one of the things is that we found is that 85% of the challenges didn't give any instruction to whether we could complement the training data provided by the organizers with our own or publicly available data. And this is very critical if we think about the fact that challenges have the reasoning that they want to perform a fair comparison. And if we don't know which training data is used, then this could be very, very critical. Further, in 66% of the tasks, there was no description on how the reference or the gold standard annotation was performed. This is also quite critical. The algorithms can only perform as good as the reference will be. And if we don't have high quality data, then our algorithms also cannot predict something meaningful. So what can we do about it? We uh, again had a look at clinical trials. And if you know that, um, you may also be aware of reporting guidelines, things like consort or for clinical, uh, for randomized uh, trials or case reports or all of those things. Uh, and we wanted to have such a guideline, reporting guideline for challenges as well. And this is why we developed uh, the bias um, statement. So the transparent reporting of biomedical image analysis challenges guideline. And we registered, registered this with the Equator Network. This is an umbrella organization for enhancing the quality and transparency of health research. And here you also find all of those other famous uh, guidelines like consort, care, strobe, and all of, all of those. So we somehow uh, made sure that the whole challenge process um, receives some quality control. The first step that we also uh, introduced is a challenge review. We didn't really have this before. And in this review step, similar to the paper review step that you probably are well aware of, uh, we have direct quality control. So we can make sure that uh, the organizers uh, have a sound challenge design and we only accept those challenges that really make sense and are good organized. However, we don't have challenge uh, don't have quality control over what they are doing when they finally execute the challenge. Because the challenge is accepted, no one will have a look at what they are doing. Well, this could uh, yeah, happen that uh, we have some uh, yeah, large issues with that. And this is, again, we looked at clinical trials. Um, we introduced the concept of challenge registration. So we uploaded the whole challenge design online so that everybody, everybody could have a look at the challenge design, make sure that they collect all the missing information that perhaps are not reported on the website. So we have some indirect quality control. 
if challenge organizers want to change something, they go back to us and we will update uh, the entry that we put online with the DOI. So these are some, some steps how we could solve the problems of reporting. Let's have a look at rankings. Rankings are very important in challenges because they tell us which algorithm is the best working solution. And this is why we should make sure that the rankings are reasonable. So let's assume we have this setting, we have multiple participants in a challenge and we have multiple images. And for each participant, each image, we have a metric score. How do we compute a ranking out of this? Well, we have different opportunities. One would be to aggregate the metric values for every patient, uh, for every participant, and uh, create a ranking based on those aggregates. Could do this with the mean, or we could also use a median or something else. Or we go uh, to the different images and create a ranking per image, a ranking per image. Um, and then we would aggregate those ranks per participant. So we have multiple ways on we could do this. We could also do completely different things. So uh, we had a look at all Mikai 2015 segmentation challenges, and we wanted to see whether rankings are stable. Here you see an example. We have a challenge of 13 algorithms, and this is the ranking that comes out if we aggregate them, uh, the values with the mean. So what would happen if we exchange mean by median? Shouldn't be such a big deal, hopefully. But if we do this for the challenge, algorithm one and five are exchanging their ranks. And this is really critical because to be honest, if we're looking at ranking tables, we are only looking at the first algorithms and not really at the fifth one. So we found by analyzing all of those challenges that they are very sensitive to a range of challenge design parameters. One is the metric that we are using for uh, the rankings, the type of aggregation, so mean or median, for example, but also the annotator. So who annotated the data will make a difference on the rankings. Let me show you another example. Here we have another challenge with, again, certain algorithms. And I highlighted three algorithms so that we can easily see how uh, things are changing. So in this first ranking scheme, we're using uh, the dice metric. We're aggregating with the mean. And let's see what would happen if we here again change, exchange mean with median. So here we don't see such a big change. So algorithm two drops down a bit, but it's kind of stable. The winner stays stable. So let's change the way how we aggregate. So let's first create a ranking per image and then aggregate with mean or median. Here we see a bit of more change. So here, for example, algorithm six is somehow really good, but the winner stays stable. And this is uh, the most important thing for our case. So let's just uh, use another metric. And here we see a very critical change because algorithm one is some suddenly dropping down to rank 11 or 10. Algorithm six is uh, among the uh, first two algorithm. Also algorithm five is quite good. And algorithm 11 was really bad in the first ranking schemes is now among the top algorithms. If we would use not, uh, another metric, then this would also be completely different. So I, I think I made the point clear that rankings are very sensitive and we should make sure that we investigate this ranking variability when we are um, when we are doing a challenge. And this brings me to the next point, the analysis of the results. We had a closer look to challenge publications and how the results of a challenge are published. And we found that nearly a third of the challenges only use ranking tables to publish the result without any kind of further visualization. And this is also a very critical point. So in this example, you see two challenges or benchmarking experiment doesn't really matter with five algorithms. And we see box and dot plots per algorithm of the raw metric values. And for this left example over here, we see that we have a direct ranking that, that we can see from this box plot. So this algorithm is definitely better than all the others. The second one is definitely better than uh, the three uh, succeeders. So we, we directly see a ranking over here, which is different for this example. All of those algorithms are really completely the same. We don't see large differences, but the problem is both of them would lead to the exact same ranking scheme. So now imagine you would only see this ranking table in a paper. You would have no idea on the individual performances 
and how close algorithms are together. And you could even go a step further and do something like a bootstrapping analysis, where we uh, have small changes in the data set and see how the rankings are changing. And this could also be visualized. Here you see so-called blob plots, and uh, every blob um, uh, tells us the frequency of bootstraps um, for which a specific rank was achieved for one algorithm. So here, for example, we see that every algorithm achieves its rank that we see in the table for 100% of all bootstrap samples. So this ranking is completely stable no matter what we do to the data set, it will stay the same. It looks completely different for the other example. We already saw it from, from the blob plots that the algorithms are very closely together. And from uh, those plots here, we see that every algorithm will achieve every rank at some point. So this ranking is completely unstable and we should really carefully interpret this. If you're interested in doing something for your own analysis, doesn't need to be a challenge, can also be a benchmarking experiment or just uh, seeing how uh, your algorithm is um, yeah, performing with different uh, hyperparameters, for example. You can try it out. It's an open source toolkit. You basically just insert a CSV file with uh, metric values and you get a full PDF report with different plots and analysis techniques out there. Let's talk about metrics. So the challenge, uh, we already saw that the rankings of a challenge highly depend on the metrics that we choose. Rankings can be completely the change, uh, changing as if we use a different metric. So we want to have a look, closer look into this topic. And most of the challenges, uh, most of the uh, metrics that we know, uh, are using rely on the so-called confusion metrics that we can see here and the cardinalities. So let me show you an example. No, okay. So let's suppose we want to classify uh, images into whether it's a penguin or not. And all images that are showing a penguin, and we're also predicting it as such, this would be true positives. If we uh, say it's no penguin, or although it is, then we would have a false negative. All the images that are other animals, and we're also predicting it as such, this are, these are true negatives. And if we have something else and we say it's a penguin, this would be a false positive. We could also do this uh, cardinalities not only at image level, which would be an image level classification. We could also do this at pixel level, for example, as we see here in those three examples. This would be a semantic segmentation. If we do a classification at object level, we would have an object detection problem. And if we would do a combination of those two, of semantic segmentation and object detection, we would end up with an instant segmentation where we're classifying objects, but at pixel level. So we could do classification at various scale, uh, scales, and we could also use similar metrics for those different, uh, uh, for different tasks. So how do we choose a metric for our problem? There's so many different metrics out there, and all of them were designed for a specific purpose. All of them have pros, but also cons, and we should be aware of all of them. And how do we do this? Nowadays, um, what we often see in papers or also in challenges is that uh, researchers are using metrics that are commonly used in the community. So for example, here you see a graphic of uh, the 500 challenges that we uh, analyzed. Most of them are using the style similarity coefficient or house of distance. But let's have a look uh, at whether this is a good idea. So say we are in an image level classification um, problem and we want to classify patients into sick and healthy. This is our data set. And we directly see it's quite imbalanced. So we have mostly images from sick class and only three images from the healthy class. Our accuracy would yield 97%, which is near perfect. But before we directly go ahead and publish this paper, we should have a look at what our prediction is really doing. And this it, uh, is what it's doing. It's doing a majority vote. It's just always saying that someone is sick because in most of the cases from the training data set, this will be true. Well, we should really be aware of those problems of class imbalance because the accuracy based on their definition is not designed to handle class imbalance. So in our case, we have uh, zero uh, true negatives, but they are overruled by the number of true positives. This would yield a, this near perfect score. If we would have computed another metric in addition, like the specificity, 
would have seen that there's definitely something going wrong with our algorithm. If we have a look at segmentation, the most commonly used metric we directly uh, already saw this is the dye similarity coefficient. For the medical domain, in uh, the computer vision domain, we have the intersectional reunion. Both of those metrics are very closely related to each other, so it's uh, basically uh, no big deal if we exchange one by uh, the other. We just shouldn't uh, use both of them together. So both of those metrics just compute the overlap of two segmentations and dividing it by uh, the number of pixels. So let's have a look at an example over here. We have this reference and two predictions. One of the prediction is doing an under segmentation, so one pixel below uh, the actual boundary. And the second prediction is an over segmentation, so one pixel above the, uh, the boundary. What would happen if we compute the dice or the IOU? Depending on the application, under and over segmentation should be treated equally, but both metrics, dice and IOU, will treat them uh, differently. So prediction one would yield a lower dice score than prediction two. And if we wanted an equal treatment, this matrix should definitely not be used. Especially as we have uh, in medical imaging, we often have uh, uncertainty in the annotations. In this paper, the authors show that uh, from multiple annotators, we have a very large uh, source of vari variability when annotating things. And uh, this is especially uh, yeah, a critical when we're choosing metrics that are treating, for example, open under segmentation not equally. Let's have a look at another example. So we want to predict this reference over here, and we have five different predictions. And I think we would all agree that not all of them would perfectly um, yeah, segment this reference over here. For example, prediction three and four really look strange and is not what we would expect. If we would now compute the dice between the reference and all of those five predictions, all of them would yield the exact same dice score. Why? Well, dice is shape unaware. So it doesn't really matter for this metric whether uh, we have strange uh, shapes or whether we are below or above the threshold, it just basically counts pixels. So if we want to assess shapes, we should use a different family of metrics that can be uh, aware of the distances from the boundaries, for example. Often problems arise from uh, phrasing the problem uh, in a wrong way. We should always keep in mind what we actually want to assess in the end. In this example, our desired reference would be an instant segmentation. So we want to distinguish between, between those two instances. And think of an example of cell segmentation, where we have many cells in an image. Um, and they often face the problem that cells are touching or overlapping. As we see in this example, those two instances are very close together. The problem is if we now only have an instant segmentation as a reference and our prediction will just burn what the reference is saying us, this pr uh, prediction would say that we have only one instance, only one object. This would get a perfect score because our reference is also saying the same. So we should be really careful on how we phrase our annotations. Similar um, for object detection, we also have sometimes a bit of a problem regarding the phrasing of the problem. In object detection, we are only interested in roughly localizing the object and uh, finding the correct class. So prediction one only finds this large object over here and misses those two tiny ones. Prediction two finds all of, uh, all of them. The large object is not uh, segmented perfectly, but this is not what we want to assess in object detection problems. So this algorithm or this prediction would be really critical and practical use. Think of an example of polyp detection. If we miss polyps in a patient, this would have very critical consequences for the patient. So we would need a metric that states that this algorithm is actually better. For object detection, we often see this also in popular challenges that the dice at pixel level is used for validation. But the dice will tell us that this prediction is actually better, although it is not solving the task. Because again, the dice just counts pixels, and those two small objects only have three pixels in total, and they don't really matter in the dice computation. So here, we should make sure that we use 
uh, metrics that are designed for object detection for, uh, purposes and not for segmentation. One final problem that I want to show you is about the metric aggregation. So we often, we, as I showed you for the rankings, we somehow need to aggregate values and we should take care of how we do this, not only for the rankings, but also for reporting the, the values. And in medical imaging, we often face the problem of hierarchical data. For example, we have data from many hospitals, from different devices, from different patients. And here you see an example that every patient has a different number of images. For example, patient one has 100 images. For patient three and four, we only have 20. So we have uh, an imbalance of the number of uh, images. If we would just compute the average um, dice score over all of those images, we would yield a dice score of 0 0.8, which is quite good. But this is not what we should do. We should uh, compute the dice value per patient, so the average dice value or another aggregate. And here we directly see that patient one gets a very high dice score, and all the others are much lower besides from patient five. So if we would then aggregate over those aggregates, we would yield a hierarchical average of the dice of 0 0.5, which is quite better um, reflecting what we're actually having because we have three patients with quite low dice values. So I showed you some problems and uh, we also collected many more in our picture story of metrics. So if you're interested in problems, uh, feel free to check. Uncovering problems is good, but uh, solving them is better. And this is why we founded the Metrics Reloaded Consortium. Perhaps you see the reference uh, to the Matrix movie. And our aim is it to find best practice recommendations for metrics in a problem aware manner. So not just choosing the metric that everyone else is using, but thinking about how do I phrase my problem and is my metric uh, suitable for that? So we're starting from the driving biomedical problem. And the most important step of this whole recommendation framework is the so-called problem fingerprinting. In this step, we're doing a structured capturing of the relevant problem properties. And we're doing this by asking several questions that are important when we select metrics. For example, are we particularly interested in the boundary of structures, more in the volume or even in the center? Um, do we want to handle spatial outliers? How should we do this? Or do we want to penalize them? Do we have very small structures in the data set? Are those structures overlapping or touching? Do we have class imbalance? Do we have uh, hierarchical data? All of those things really matter when we want to pick metrics and the problem fingerprint will help us in doing so. You just see an overview of the whole metric recommendation framework. Um, so this is based on uh, like a decision tree fashion. We have a main uh, graph that we see here and we have different sub processes denoted with this plus symbol. So uh, don't worry, we will go into a, a few examples in a second, so you don't need to uh, read everything. Uh, so, But uh, just one note, um, it's designed for the four problem categories that I showed you before, for image level classification, object detection, instant segmentation, and semantic segmentation, because they are very closely related, because all of them are doing classification at different scales, and also the metrics are quite similar across them. So let's have a look at an example. Say we want to do an image level classification. Um, more specifically, we're interested in dermoscopic images and uh, we want to do a disease classification. So we have, for example, such an input over here and the requested output would be something like this where we are giving some probabilities uh, on the different diseases that may occur. Here you see the traversal through the primary path, so uh, the diagram that I showed you before. And we have different steps uh, that we go through. So first, uh, we make sure that we have the correct problem category, just to make sure that we are avoiding those problems where we inappropriately phrase the problem. So we have an image level classification. Then we generate a problem fingerprint. And all of those steps that follow will be based on this fingerprint. So. Uh, first, we select uh, multi-class counting metrics. Counting metrics are all those metrics that rely on the confusion matrix. So for example, um, uh, this multi-class metrics, um, the specific thing about them is that they don't rely on the definition of a positive and a negative class. 
if you remember the example from before where we wanted to classify patients into sick and healthy, we said that sick class is positive and healthy would be negative. So those multi-class metrics that don't care about those things and they rely on uh, all cardinalities of the confusion matrix. If we have predicted class scores available, so those probabilities that we see here, we can go ahead and select a multi-threshold metric. Multi-threshold metrics operate on different thresholds, so we're not selecting one cutoff value to define the confusion matrix, but we're operating on multiple of them, and uh, those multi-threshold metrics are curve-based. So, for example, the area under the rock curve or area under the precision recall curve, those are uh, the metrics that we call multi-threshold metrics. Then we can also select per class counting metrics. Counting metrics, again, those are those metrics relying on the confusion matrix. And the per class uh, counting metrics mean the metrics that rely on the definition of a positive and a negative class. Yeah, and for all of the uh, recommendations, we rely on the fingerprint, which is always uh, shown by this fingerprint symbol over here. And all, each fingerprint has a specific number. So let's. Uh, zoom into it a little bit and see how this actually um, looks like. So let's first uh, select a multi-class metric for our problem. The first question is whether we have a, a predefined cutoff value on the predicted class score. So do we have already uh, a value where we say, okay, we want to uh, have a true positive or positives at a value of 0 0.5, for example, uh, and Yes, we say in our example, we have something like this. Then the next question would be, do we need to compensate of unequal class frequencies? So for example, we have balanced data. Um, is our data reflecting our the real data? Yes, we want to have something like this. Um, do we uh, need an unequal handling of class confusions? Um, this means, do we need to unequally handle false positives and false negatives? Depending. detection example, here we want to make sure that we find all of the different uh, polyps. And in this case, we would treat false negatives um, as very important, and we would punish them more if we have uh, many of them in our data set. So yes, we want uh, such an unequal and you know, class confusions also in our example. We want to make sure that we are really um, predicting uh, the right diseases. And then we're already at the end node for this multi-class metric, which says select BA, which is the balanced accuracy, or MCC, the Matthews correlation coefficient, based on decision guide. And we have multiple decision guides uh, for the metric selection, which um, kind of discuss the pros and cons of different metrics, um, when should we use one over the other. And in our case, the decision guide will point us to the Matthews correlation coefficient. So now we already have one metric. We continue with the next ones, uh, where we first check the problem category, because um, as I said, all of those problem categories directly are related to each other. And for object detection, we would follow another path. But here we are in the image level classification, short ILC. And uh, here the uh, yeah decision tree is quite easy. We directly are uh, in the end node of selecting the area on the rock curve or the average precision, which is basically uh, an interpolation of uh, the precision recall curve. And based on our decision guide, we say we're using the area under the rock curve. For the multi-threshold metrics, we also have another um, node over here that says check if we need output calibration. This means that the predicted class scores that we have for our um, <clears throat> prediction should also somehow um, make sure that they are real, the real probabilities of what predicting and not, not just any values. So we also need some calibration in our case. Last step would then be to select per class counting metrics. Again, we are checking our problem category, which is image level classification. We have the same question that we already replied to. So do we have a cutoff value? Um, and yes, we have something like this. And then we're at this end node. It says select a beta score or a positive likelihood ratio. Based on the decision guide, we're using this positive likelihood ratio. And these are our three metrics that we're recommending for this problem of disease classification and 
dermoscopic images. But I wanted to show you another example um, for semantic segmentation. For example, this scenario would be liver segmentation and CT images, as we see over here. So we would perhaps at the first glance say, well, uh, those problems are quite different, but we can follow similar steps over here. We again generate our problem fingerprint, uh, problem category first, uh, which is the semantic segmentation. Then we generate the problem fingerprint. And then we select overlap-based metrics and boundary-based metrics. Overlap-based metrics is just a way how we call counting metrics for segmentation problems. And those are metrics like the DICE and the IOU. Boundary-based metrics are the metrics that can take care of shape unawareness, for example, because they're measuring the distance between um, one boundary to the other. Um, we also have can select uh, metrics that are specific to our application and do some aggregation steps. So let's zoom in and see how it looks like for segmentation. First, we want to select the overlap-based metrics where we again check for the problem category. This is semantic segmentation. And then we check if we need an overlap-based metric. In most of the cases, we argue yes. We have a few exclusion criteria, but it just makes sense to measure the overlap between two segmentations. So yes, we need an overlap-based metric and continue to the next question where we're asking if we're exclusively interested in the center line of structures. In our case, we're not. This would be interesting for problems where we have tubular structures, things like airway trees or vessels. But in our case, we have a large organ and so we're not interested in a center line. We asked whether we want an unequal handling of class confusions. This is the same question that we saw previously. So do we want an unequal handling of false positives and negatives? In segmentation, this would mean, do we want to unequally handle over-segmentation and under-segmentation? In our case, we don't want to do this. Both of them should be equally treated. And then in, we're in the end node where the decision guide will tell us the decision between DICE and IOU is more a question of communities. They are so closely related in a mathematical sense and medical community is favoring the DICE. But we already saw DICE comes with several limitations. So we need another metric that can compensate those problems. And this is why we're selecting boundary-based metrics. Again, we check if we need such a metric. Um, for example, we're interested in boundaries. So yes, we need such a metric. Um, the next question is then, do we want to compensate annotation imprecisions? I already showed you that we often have integrated variability in medical imaging, and there are metrics that can um, compensate for those. So let's suppose in our example, we have some integrator variability, and we don't want to punish our algorithms for things where the experts also not agreeing. And this is why we're selecting the normalized surface distance, the NSD. And this metric comes with a, another parameter um, where we can handle um, how much distance do we are we tolerating from the boundaries. And everything within that uh, distance uh, would be counted as true positives and would be OK to uh, be in this uh, tolerated distance. We could either end here, or we could think whether we need to select some property-related metrics. For liver segmentation, for example, we often just want to simply um, see how large is the volume of our, um, of our liver. This is especially interesting for the clinicians. And this is why we're just adding an application-specific metric for the volume, which would, for example, be the absolute volume difference or the volume similarity. We would then follow metric application steps, which would be some recommendations regarding the uh, aggregation of results, uh, for example, what I showed you before uh, with respect to the hierarchical data, and then we're at the end of this uh, scenario over here. Yeah, and we wanted to instantiate this whole recommendation framework for um, different use cases from the biomedical domain because we think it makes it just more graspable for everyone and uh, to make sure um, perhaps we are already co collected your biomedical use case. So I showed you um, the concrete path for the first two. But we also have this for object detection, for polyp detection and colonoscopy videos uh, with a predefined sensitivity that we want to reach. And also for cell nuclei uh, instance segmentation from microscopy. 
uh, where we then have concrete recommendations and also uh, images that you saw before where we directly instantiate the problem fingerprint. But we would be very happy if you could help us because we want to have as many different use cases covered as possible. And we have a survey for this. And perhaps, Doreen, you can uh, collect the links. Thank you. And send it in the chat. Um, if you want to give some feedback on what I have told you about this whole recommendation uh, framework. If you're uh, saying, well, this metric is missing or I don't want to use this metric, um, please let us know. You also have the, feed, uh, the possibility to just give one click feedback and you can also say which scenarios should we cover. Um, so use cases that you want to see for the problems of image level classification, semantic segmentation, object detection, instance segmentation. This would be really great. I uh, would be very happy for this. And also, if you want to check out uh, our paper, feel, feel free to do so. But uh, this paper is very long and uh, quite difficult to understand. And this is why we're also currently in parallel are working on a web-based tool that makes it easier to use and uh, just guides the user through the different questions of the problem fingerprint. Um, yeah, and we hope to release this uh, quite soon so that you can directly start on your metric recommendations. Yeah, and with this, I would like uh, to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm very happy to discuss your metric problems and uh, your questions. Thank you. Yeah, Annika, thank you for this great talk. I, th I think you um, really made clear how metrics matters. And um, yeah, now you have the great opportunity to ask plenty of questions. You can raise your hand or use the chat function. Feel free to do so. I think uh, the audio, uh, this is to the audience. Uh, it's not maybe not only about questions, but it's also fine if you if you have comments, uh, if you want to encourage us to integrate some something more in the framework, consider more aspects that we haven't covered. Anything uh, really is welcome. But there's a question now. Yeah. Hi. Um... First of all, thanks for the great talk. It was really great. I really wanted to participate when I saw Lena's <laughs> Twitter post because that 101 page PDF is a bit intimidating. <laughs> I, it's on my agenda. I want to read it, but it's really hard to get through it. So I'm happy to have gotten a, an overview from you and great talk really. Um, and then I had a question which you answered in that very last slide, whether there is an interactive tool that helps you huddle through this sort of and this web-based tool, what is the ETA on this roughly? Like, uh, when do you think will this be available? Yeah, so we're working together with uh, some designers to make it um, yeah, more beautiful and uh, good to use. So we're currently in the phase where we're collecting community feedback on the framework. And I mean, uh, of course, you know, it uh, always depends a bit, but we hope to uh, publish this before summer. So before the summer break. The the, the web based August. tool even yes oh cool wow that's uh, that's earlier than I than I was hoping for that's great cool. the beta version though the one without yeah. the whole design uh, fancy stuff uh, it's a yeah, beta version of course yeah sure sure um, and then the a, a bit naive question is there something like a like a safe bet um, because I mean. I saw what you uh, what you did for segmentation and sort of the community has been converging towards using dice and some form of surface distance, Hausdorff distance or normalized surface distance or something. And that was sort of a natural convergence of the community towards that. And it's something like a safe bet. If you use the two, then, then you're kind of safe in most scenarios. Is there something like that for the different um, categories of problems that you uh, discussed today it's classification versus segmentation or something or is that from your experience it's not really an open question is that from your mm. experience really dangerous yeah like to have a normal set of two or three metrics to go uh, to have i mean as you see from here we don't have like hundreds of metrics in here um it's, it's not like uh you could use uh, so many different you have so many different possibilities um, of course, it's always a bit dangerous to say just always use dice and NSD um, because every metric has some limitations. But for example, in object detection, AP is a metric, so average precision is a metric that is commonly used. Um, so in most of our cases, it's the decision between two or three metrics um, where you should be aware of the different pros and cons. 
So I wouldn't say we can always say, use this and that metric, then you're fine. Um, but I think it's uh, okay if we have like, choose one of those two and then you should be fine. And for things like segmentation, um, it's a good thing if we're using metrics from different families. So DICE has problems, House of Distance or NSD, whatever, also have some problems. But if we use both of them, we can compensate for the problems of the other. I think this is a very important step and that we're not using that are closely metrics that are closely related in the uh, same rankings, but metrics that are assessing different properties. And if I understand correctly, you could use this challenge R tool from your lab to um, to aggregate those two metrics and or like to compare the, your method to other methods by aggregating them via rank and so on, right? So, because that's another thing, like if you have two metrics from two different families, like how do you combine them? But I think that that's what the challenge R tool is for, right? Yeah, so currently this is an, uh, a thing that we're also discussing uh, how we would actually do this do we want to have an aggregate of different metrics? Because think of the dice, for example, is bounded between zero and one, where one is the perfect value. House of distance is unbound to the top and zero would be the perfect value. How would you actually aggregate this? So it's it's not straightforward. And this is where we're currently collecting also the recommendations for those topics. And currently in the challenge R, it's only for one metric at one uh, time point. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, as I said, we're working on this, but uh, I think it's always a good idea to also have a look at the individual rankings also to see if perhaps one algorithm is very good at the perfect outlines of a segmentation and the other algorithm is better for the actual inside of uh, the segmentation. And it's also interesting to get insights from that point of view. But maybe as a spoiler, uh, so one way to do it is to to um, basically merge at the ranking level. So especially yeah. when you have two rankings, then you can do a so-called consensus ranking, for example, which statistically finds the, the, yeah, the best ranking given the two available rankings. But um, yeah, that, this, this is currently under discussion, as Annika says, and you will hear more right there later. But if you need a keyword, consensus ranking would be one. Cool. Super valuable work and great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. We have another raised hand. It's Florian Heil. It's your turn. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, uh, Annika. Very, very nice talk. Um, my question goes a bit, so you looked um, mainly, as far as I understood, at algorithm spaces. So I, I'm working for the uh, Galaxy and, and the GHGA. So my question goes a bit into a more, more complex topic in uh, benchmarking of pipelines. Have you uh, looked into this as well uh, and is this applicable uh, what you have done to uh, pipelines could you uh, shortly um, clarify what what kind of pipelines do you mean <laughs> data analysis pipeline so okay. um, let's say you have a single cell on ASIC data and um, so you're not looking only at one algorithm, but maybe let's say you want to, um, again, identify uh, the clustering of these uh, cells, but it, obviously you uh, connect um, a mapping algorithm and also a clustering algorithm and so on. And so at the end, you have a connection of different tools. Mm -hmm. uh, algorithms which at the end contribute each individually to uh, a result right so have you looked at that not directly but uh, i think uh, depending on on what is the output uh, of of this data pipeline it could be applicable because what this framework is only looking at the outputs so it doesn't really care of which kind of algorithm we're using whether it's this architecture or another one it's just, um, yeah, need some outputs, for example, for classification, we, we need those uh, predicted class probabilities for segmentation. In many cases, we don't have them and we're always asking for them. So if you have a, a classification at some point, independent from the algorithm, this would work. But if you have a different kind of a problem like regression output or something, this is currently not covered in this uh, framework. 
it's quite more complex than we first uh, thought uh, in the beginning. So we we're working on this for more than one and a half years. So um, quite complex topic. So, but uh, I think it's applicable for many situations. It's not only for challenges or algorithms, but just something uh, at classification scale. And can I ask a question back um, to understand your request, basically? Um, I mean, so far, what we considered was, okay, often you have a problem, for example, at patient level, but then you, which is similar to what you described, you also have different modules and you also want to know about them. So, so far in the framework, we handle this by saying, okay, we have basically one task at patient level, say, let's say cancer or no cancer. And then we have the different modules where, for example, a, mod a segmentation model, and then there we validate on module level and you would go mm -hmm. through a different branch of the tree. So, uh, so we would say module X has, you know, this performance and the whole patient level pipeline has this performance. Are you requesting something beyond this? Kind of say mm, that you still look at the module level, but have in mind that you maybe change the alignment algorithm and see how the module changes based on the alignment mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a different. So you connect the modules, basically. So this yeah. is what, what I suggest. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I understand. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like Annika said, it's not covered, but we always it's it's always interesting to get this fun kind of feedback because and you know we are uh continuously working on this. I think yeah. it's not on the immediate uh, agenda, but uh, happy to talk about it and see whether we come up uh, with something because we are also working strongly uh, together closely with the statistics team here and yeah. they also also have uh, very nice ideas often on, you know, Con yeah, contributing factors to an end goal and these kind of things are probably important in a pipeline. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, happy to, to discuss this at some point. But sorry, Anja, okay. cannot uh, store your time. <laughs> I was interested in this, <laughs> about this request. No, but what's very interesting, currently we have uh, also suggesting if you have a problem that is uh, compiled of multiple problems, then just use uh, different recommendations for every sub problem. But it would also be nice to have something like this covered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice, nice work. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So if there's another question, if not, we would end here. So again, Annika, thank you for giving a talk here. And um, thank you to the audience. Especially also thank you to Lena for supporting us here. And um, <laughs> yeah, wish you all a good time and see you for the next data science seminar. Goodbye, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.